Every successful person got there by going through tough times. Success is a hard-ass teacher who likes to knock you around along that journey. You know, it takes real guts to not give up and keep going. We'll hear stories about failures and how these leaders flip the script to create success. I'm John Schultz. Join me and let's discover how success is never really overnight. So welcome to the John Schultz podcast. Uh, so excited for this one. Uh, a fellow YPOer, which is one of my favorite organizations. Uh, I've been in it for a long time and I meet so many amazing people, amazing businesses. Uh, and we have Jenny Jing Zhu here, founder and CEO of Lush Decor Home and Triangle Home Fashions, two amazing brands uh, that is making tremendous traction in the market today. As I said, a fellow YPO member, for those who don't know what YPO is, it's a, a large CEO organization that's global, and we meet so many amazing people by being a part of it. We learn so much. And also, Jenny was New Jersey Entrepreneur of the Year in 2019, uh, which is amazing. So welcome to the show. Thank you, John. Glad to be here. Yeah, this is uh, very exciting. I'm glad to be able to learn your story today. So. This is about the myth to overnight success. You know, it starts, I think, like really early and we don't realize it when we're young and all the lessons that we don't even realize we're learning, but they come back to help us uh, as we grow and in our careers, our professional life, personal life and everything else that we do. So my first question would be, how do you describe yourself growing up in your early child years? Well, how do I? Uh, I would say I'm a very stubborn and a rebellious childhood. <laughs> My mom will totally agree with you. I got uh, so many spanks when I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So, so, and like, what did you learn from your childhood? How, like, how, how did how do you think? Were there some lessons, you know, like, what did you feel growing up? What were your aspirations growing up? You know, how did you uh, sort of make it through your early life? So I was born in a very, very remote village in China. Um, is we don't have electricity, no indoor plumbing, and it's, it's a very rustic childhood. Um, but it's... What I really learned in my, you know, early stages is like, there's two things when you're talking about it, like jumping into my memory is in my, uh, when I was six years old and, um, you know, in the village, the best treat is ice, frozen ice cube, <laughs> which is like, is a dream for all the kids we wish we could. Of course, my parents never gave me money to allow me to do that. And uh, I saw there is a brick manufacturer around the village. All the adults try to make extra money, go to that, you know, to loading the trucks. So I saw them lining up. I said, okay, if they can make money, why can I? So I line up with them. I said, okay, I'm not, I cannot really, you know, carry very heavy bricks, but I can run fast. So I line up. I, <laughs> I literally worked as hard as I could and like sweaty and, you know, try to don't let people look down on me because I was only six years old. So I did really hard. I earned my first pennies. I think when I was six years old, I is the best treats I ever. I didn't tell my parents, and I had my own money. I think that's one thing is really started from six years old. I wanted to have my own financial freedom. When you look at that, uh, that's one thing. Is another thing is like after high school, uh, my parents, my mom was teacher. He, she always wanted me to be you know, a teacher at that time, being a teacher is a very, you know, is a highest dream. I think my mom could uh, imagine to have a stable salary, to be respectful. 
Um, but I never had in my head to be a teacher as my dream. I said, oh my God, they're going to kill me. I, and I have no patience to be a teacher. So then I saw an article from a magazine is about this girl from another village and went to Guangzhou and worked in a factory and then later started her own business and built this business on her. So when I read that article, I said, oh my God, there's saying can be a business owner, can be an entrepreneur, can like, you know. So I said, if she can do it, why can I? So then I started to talk to my parents. I said, okay, I need to get out of the village. I want to go to the big city. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And so that's kind of like started my own entrepreneurial journey. Of course, there's a lot of uh, struggles with my parents because there's never been the way they think you never can make it work and you are ruining your life and, you know, don't do it. I just... I ran away a few times. I didn't like, you know, did everything possible to make them to <laughs> let me to do. So that's kind of the first time in the end they agreed with me. And uh, so they allowed me to go to Beijing. My uncle was in Beijing, found me a job uh, in the hotel as the housemaid <laughs> in the hotel. <laughs> that's my first job out of the village. How, how old were you then? I was 19. Wow. So yeah, that's, that's a huge change in my life. And I get out of the village, went to Beijing. So, so I, I mean, I'm, I'm a little blown away. It, it, it's amazing, even at such a young age, it's like, what do I want? What don't I want? And you were able to actually take conviction at such a young age and go and be a little entrepreneur. I mean, like, and just do it. It's your, like, I, my favorite commercial is the Nike commercial, just do it. Yeah. But at six years old, I don't even know what I was thinking. And, <laughs> and you know, but it was almost you were forced to push forward and you did, and you, you, you stood up to the challenge, which is amazing. Yeah. In the village at that time is like in China, the boys, always important than girls is a, is a traditional because the boys considered to be the household head and then they earn the income, support the family, and they carry, the most important is carry the bloodline of the family. So I think in the somehow in my like brain, I said, okay, if the boys can do it, I can do it too. So I literally did everything. I cut the grasses that helped my parents. That's always like something, I don't know, it's just stuck in my head. I want to support the family as the boys can do. Uh, you know, that's the whole that's amazing. life I through. Was there any, because you're, you're so young and you have sort of your parents pushing you away from this dream, this feeling that you had, were there any mentors or anything? It was, I mean, obviously you read an article and that spurred a, yeah. you know, a big thing inside you, mm -hmm. by the way, was that, was it a specific person that you read about that you followed after that? Or what, like, what, how did you get yourself to keep going at such a young age? Was when there mentors had, or who? Um, right. When I had regarding the mentor, so that, lady i read on the magazine actually i never really follow up with him i just that is a spark got inside got in me i said okay that's really introduced me is like as a girl from the village you can reach to that goal so my first mentorship probably would be like when i got to beijing and working in the hotel is like the first time, you know, you clean the toilet. It's not a fancy five-star hotel. It's really like a very small government-owned hotel. You, you know, change the sheets, wiping the floors, clean the toilet, a lot of things. It's a lot of different than what I thought it would be. But I did it for a year and a half. All in my head is, how can I do my business? How can I start it? You know, it, there's nothing I could really, you know, try to do. Say, so, okay, I needed to learn some skills. So the first skill I learned is to be a skin 
care specialist to get a certificate. So now I look at the newspaper, I find the first job as working, you know, there's a doctor, woman doctor, quit her job and from another city went to Beijing, open her medical spa. So I applied for that job and she became my first mentor, actually. I didn't realize that it was until I started to write my book, actually, to look back. She was she was divorced in the 40s and she instead of staying in the same city she wanted to go to beijing to open her own business quit her doctor job it's at that time the doctor job is oh my god you never can be say okay you have that job that be holding for your life she kind of defied the whole situation she just wanted to start her own business so i i got the job and the spa was not even started yet. They just started renovation. So the first three months I worked with her, I, I said, you know, she was in a very difficult situation. I said, okay, I don't need to get a pay. I just wanted to get in this job. So she, she doesn't have a lot of money. So we lived in a basement in a like apartment in Beijing high rise. There's no windows, there's no, you know, you use a public bathroom, like all the whole nine yard is like, I witnessed the first hand how she overcome so much obstacles to start her business. It's literally like, you know, you could see her almost crying. You could see her how to dealing with the you know, the government to get that business going, get that sign to be in the front door. So that's like, I think that has really taught me a lot of things. I didn't even realize that at that time. But when I started a business here, then I realized how strong, how like that determination, the way I started with him, with her for the first, you know, year and a half. Um, then the business took off and I earned, I never thought I earned that kind of money in my whole life with her. So yeah, that's kind of the first thing I think if you ask for the mentor, she would be my first mentor. That's and amazing. I love that. You know, I love the analogy. Uh, you read this article, everything looked glamorous. Right. Yeah. Yes. The idea of everything that we want to pursue is glamorous because it feels good and it's something we want to do. But when you get there, it's never really what we expect. It's how we think about it and how we make it work for ourselves to keep progressing. Do you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you did that. So, all right. So 19, you're, you're making money you never thought you would make. Hopefully you bought a lot of ice cubes, I guess, at that time. Or is it was it something else? <laughs> In Beijing, the ice cube is a much delicious. They actually put a creamy in it. <laughs> oh, good. So you so you, you got there, and then what happened next? So when after I working with her, then I had my first boyfriend, and we started our laundry business, like a dry clean business. Oh, That's wow. my first real business in you know to doing it and. Um, I was like, it's actually the store next door to the spa in the one of the most busy, busiest street in like, you know, in a tech uh, area. And there's a, ex, a stock exchange across the street. There's a lot of people, you know. At great location. They have the uh, I'm in real estate. That sounds like a great location. I like that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. I tried everything possible. I remember I had to do the marketing. I did the bronze plantium go card, try to get it. And is really the business really took it off really good. I remember like in my at that time, you know, it's all cash. Uh in I, I, I counted like one day, I said one of the biggest day we had. I counted the money. I said, Oh my god, my finger got hurt. So it's like <laughs> that's so funny at that time. I said, oh, Wow, <laughs> this is great. Then like I said, okay, I, my goal is like our goal is like how we can be the biggest 
dry clean business in Beijing because there's one only government on. They are in all these different locations. They are very like high end kind of like the business. So that's our goal, how we can be multiple location to be the number one to build that business, you know, well, it's towards that direction. Then we broke up. So, <laughs> so how, but how how many did, did you just do one? Did you get a bunch going? How, we just how did, did one. Actually, we also started with to take over some hotels. You know, it could be really big at that time. We just like you know, there's some hiccup. <laughs> That's All right. Well, listen, plans to, but again, that's, that's the whole point, right? Like yeah. we, we move through things and we got to pivot. All right. So, so that ended, but at least you got, it sounds like you got a lot of experience of what it feels like to be a complete entrepreneur, right? Like yeah. from your business card design to, you know, getting it all up and running from systems. Right. Uh, yeah. so, so what happened next? Uh, in your in your career like so what, what, then later uh because like you know uh, my ex-husband we want to go to to uh san francisco actually is his idea he wanted to finish his law school he said you know we said okay we're gonna go to america for two years after his law school we're gonna go back so that I can start, you know, my mind is I wanted to learn more, to explore more, to see the world, see how I can, you know, it's more learning mode. Um, I didn't realize is like how difficult it was because when I, when we came here uh, in end of 1999, I remember when I landed in San Francisco, turned on the TV. I felt I was on Mars. I couldn't understand one word of English at that time. So that's really set me a reality. What did I get myself into? There's no friends. There's no job. There's no communication. So I, my, but I never can just sitting at a house. So my first job was a nanny and uh to uh have a couple olivia uh, uh the the jennifer and rob so their baby olivia was not even born yet when i got the job so it's really like start of you know the the best thing about that job is the because baby olivia doesn't speak english <laughs> so it's like <laughs> it's unbelievable i love that That's and great. so we we really you know i I learned a lot about the American culture, how live in is as an American household with Jennifer and Rob and take care of the Olivia for a year and a half. And in the meantime, I learned the English through the PBS cooking shows. I just, that's, you know, when you're away from home, the one thing is your, the cooking, the food make you feel like, you know, you're at home. And so I love cooking. So, oh, I wait, wait, so you actually learn English from a cooking show. <laughs> yeah, like so cooking like, show. That's where I think can keep me engaging all the time. So that's the best thing. I, I learned the English uh, for that year and a half. And also went to the city college, you know, did some English learning as ESL. So then my um you know then my ha uh husband found a job in new york after that so i said okay this is gonna be more longer than i thought so i needed to know what i wanted to do for my life and uh and so i heard the very one story you know it's glamorous i love all the wedding guns so said, oh my god that's so cool i wanted to be a fashion designer you know is but i have a zero zero experience on fashion design i didn't even have any design you know art training whatsoever you know when i grew up yeah so when i i said okay uh, what a college i needed to go so the fashion institute of technology in new york is very popular for fashion design so i went there and they told me is the fashion major was full you need to wait for another year i said oh my god 
I was 28. I don't have time to <laughs> wait for another year. So they have the home textile surface design still open at that time. So I said, all right, it's not that far away. I want to apply that one. So they said, you need like the portfolio. I never heard of that word in my whole life. So portfolio, what that portfolio? So of course, later I went to the Canal Street, I went to the pro, there's like all the you know, art store to bought all the brushes, papers or stuff, went home in my own imagination, did a collage, did all the things for three days, like literally my small studio, like tornado. And then that corner did a drawing, collage, all the whole nine yard and I submitted and I got accepted. I guess I have some creativity in me. <laughs> wow. I love it. You know, you have, it's just, Every story is something that you just, you seem to, uh, you had to live in complete uncertainty in yeah. everything. And odds were it wouldn't happen, but you still tried. Yeah. And not, I'm sure not every one of these things worked out, right? You got to, you know, you, you, yeah. you kept moving on. Uh, it, it's fantastic. So, okay. So you got into this textile school, uh, was that something, I mean, was it just Vera Wang? I mean, I know you had no, but did you have a, an affinity for fashion or decor or it was it more just her story completely inspired you as a woman? So that's part of it. But as a woman who doesn't love home decor, right? <laughs> you always want, you know, that's always love. I, I I love the beautiful things. I, whether it's apparel or whether it's a home, it's just, I feel like that would be great if I build a business based on something I love, even though I don't have the training foundation at that time. But I always believe that, you know, I, I, I don't know who said that. I think it's Tony Robbins said is the only impossible journey is that never even begins. Yes, so I just, 100%. I tried it. I tried it hard. And uh, I think that's, you know, that's... Not just a barrel story, but also that's what I wanted to do. That's amazing. Uh, listen, I, I, you know, I love, I love people. So I, I love stories and I get so much out of every story and every podcast. It, it inspires me to keep moving forward and doing it. All right. So you graduated, you got through it. And then when did you think you were going to start your next business? So after I graduated and uh, I went, you know, in the last semester, it's really hard. I sent out so many resumes <laughs> it's because as a foreign student, it's very hard to get the job because you need to get a sponsor and not, you cannot just like apply job based on your capability. You can get it. It's because I was a foreign student at that time you need the company willing to sponsor you. It's very hard. I send so many, there's only one company willing to sponsor me. So I worked in the company for four years and it was so... And what company was this? Rewarding. It's a home textile company in Got the it. same field. And, uh, you know, it's when I started in the last semester, I remember... You know, the I don't know if you know, there's a building called Textile Building. Now they change at 295 Fifth Avenue. Yeah, yeah. It's a whole district, yeah. Yeah, that is like a holy grail of the home textile business in that building as all the big home textile companies. I did is like, I thought, okay, what would be the best to send your resume in that lobby so i went to that lobby i saw all these people walking you know in the morning to go upstairs so give i literally give them resume say okay hopefully they can hire me to be one of the studio i can work in and it's 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 one of my experience i didn't get the job actually from that resume i i, I gave away but it's like in 2010, I did have my own showroom in that building. So, <laughs> so did one of these people give you the job with that day, or you did, that no, was just something? You did. Did. Yeah, it came in another way, but you, you have to take different way. actions. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's you know you try, 
<laughs> you try and you keep doing, and it right. seems that's a trend. I, I, so now, now we're getting to where you're going to open your business here, right? Yeah. So that was in 2008, right? In 2008, after I worked in the four years and my baby was one year old and I was in the middle of divorce, it's like, it's a perfect storm. It's during the financial crisis. <laughs> so I remember at that time, it's like, you know, I always dreamed one day, one day I will have my business, one day I will, you know, this or that. It's, I just like, I feel like I never, if that one day could be turned never. So it really hit me hard in 2008. I said, okay, it's not a one day I will, it's a today I will. So then I started in 2008. I thought if I can get through this, I can get through everything. Even though if you ask all my, you know, some of my friends, my family, they all think I was crazy. I have a very, stable job and you have a baby, you know, why you make this change? It could be you lose everything. But I was determined I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. I'm not gonna wait anymore. So I had this vision is to create affordable luxury in the market and and you know with a large decor brand. But it's the first business plan really didn't go very well. And in the beginning is more is a traditional business. You present your design to all the brick mortar store, and then you get an order, and then you ship them. You don't you don't have you have zero control. And, you know, it's after a year is really changed. I realized is really hard to work in that traditional business model. And I saw there's e commerce marketplace and an e-commerce dropship is really very rare. All my competitors or my, you know, the similar business, they all walked away. The reason is you have to design your own line. You have to bring in your own inventory. Then you have to drop ship one order at a time, which is impossible for, for a startup. Is it just doesn't, yeah, it just right. doesn't, you know, sounds it that's a good plan. I sort of is like, okay, is there's if nobody think that's possible, if I can make it work, that could be huge. So that's I started. I started 2009. I started the turn this into the business, into e-commerce marketplace focus the business model we under the large decor brand and that that was early that I was mean, very early. think about it where we are today yeah I, I mean you know today you've got 3d virtual scanning designs of front yeah. i mean you, you you were 2d like like it was you know who would buy anything of that size or value on the e-commerce yeah, i so. remember people saying is who can buy your bedding you know the window trimming online they cannot touch they cannot feel how could it be possible so we started with coast.com at that time and i remember we you know i brought the design in the first collection then we started drop ship every day end of the day i wear my high heel with a few of my colleagues go to the back you know we we don't have like you know really uh, system is all menu is warehouse is like a mountain with the boxes you know <laughs> we go down go to the back and you cannot really bring you know today's they all palletized everything yep. in the right place we have to like ship that mountain to catch the box you know fall from the top <laughs> and slash the labels and you know dump into the ups fedex truck that's how we started it's like after a year, I think we got a call from Cole saying, you know, can you come for this meet the summit? We were so broke. It's not broke. We were so like, you know, we don't have budget to travel or do something. We don't even know what's happening. So two weeks later, we got this uh, trophy, a uh, rookie of the year. 
that's kind of wow. So we started so since out of nowhere. Did you apply for it? Did you just no, nothing? <laughs> you just got a rookie of the year. I think it's like we knew the business is growing from that channel, and uh, soon after we really turned into you know 30, 40 different e commerce marketplace, and the business just going into the right direction. We build the system, we start you know with improve the operation excellence it's it's just like it's a lot of learning which you know from that 4000 square feet warehouse to 58000 square feet house and then to 200000 square wow. it's a kind of like every learning the way is we're still learning but it, you know it's never been perfect and um all right so let's talk about that cuz i i think that's exact What's fascinating about you, to me, you don't need anything to be perfect. As a matter of fact, it's worse than perfect. It's like something that you have no, almost no clue on where you're going, yet you are not afraid. Where do you feel entrepreneurs make the biggest strides or not strides based on that premise? I mean, like, how do you get a mentality that things don't have to be perfect? Like, what, what drives you to... To, to do that so i think is it you know i don't have mba <laughs> when i start the business is everything is learned along the way um i feel like you know as entrepreneur is you cannot be afraid of the failures and is a lot of time is i think what would really block us is you know, what if we fail? What if like, you know, is something is not work out? What if it's not perfect? I think that's one thing is I learned when you go back is every, I feel every failure, everything is like every time when I hit a wall, I always joking, one of the, my friend actually told me, you know, I see you is when you see a wall, you don't see a wall, you see the bricks. And you see how to use that bricks to build a bridge to go through it. it I think it's it's very honoring to hear that. But I think that's a lot of, of us, you know, from the YPO, every entrepreneur you go through that is every time we feel we hit so many walls. When you hit the wall is really how to judge whether you are good business entrepreneur you're going to go through that or yet is how the mindset you see the wall and you know we cannot we never say we not give up it's not just give up it's how you really you see that how you can build the from turn that barrier into opportunity i always saying is like in 2008 if you just think in that time that's nothing most people will say you don't start it. It's not the right time. It's just like, I think it's really how you turn every obstacle into opportunity. Every time, it's, especially in the dark time, I always feel there's something is really hit deep. You can find the opportunity to turn to the brightest future. I don't know. It's, I, I'm more, I'm very I, listen, optimistic. I, I agree with you. I, I, I feel, especially as an entrepreneur, when things are dislocated, yeah. it's sort of like the person that was doing it the same way perfectly for years and all of a sudden it's not so perfect anymore. Yeah. It puts everyone on the same playing field. Like people are willing to listen more. They want to learn more when things are going wrong because they're scared, they're worried. Yeah, I, I think that, and that's when we started most of our businesses, our our new things in my yeah. industry. Because if you know, if you're not afraid, and again, I think if you have a learning mindset, yeah, you're not afraid to change because you're like most people think like I don't want to have to relearn and redo this all again. But by looking at it that way, you might find why your product or whatever you do can pivot and be better. And it seems like that's just ingrained in your personality so what would what would okay so you're, you're going you got this rookie award unbelievable out of nowhere i think most things happen out of nowhere if we just keep moving forward uh what were some of the defining moments though that got you to sort of where you are today uh was it you know not being afraid to grow 
you know, how did you, how did you scale yourself uh, as an entrepreneur? Um, it's, I think it's like when I um, start the business, when we grow, now I really, in, I think in the 2016, I got a seriously burnout. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just, I think, I don't know how many, like us entrepreneur, you know, once in your time, sometimes you need to get us really, really burn out. I was at the stage, I couldn't keep up the business, you know, growth. I see the growth, I see the opportunity, but it's hard for me to, I think the one of the biggest thing is if you see the opportunity and you I feel I cannot push fast enough. Then you're getting just everything is tangled together. It's like that is my situation in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, so I started getting this um, emails or like phone cold calls say, hey, do you want to sell your business? I said, it's all the scams. I don't have like, you know, going on what that means sell my business i remember one time as i really need i think in order to grow i need a big warehouse i need more people i need more system in places uh so we at that time uh we use very minimum like you know fishbowl in 2011 just never can you know sustain the business so we needed the erp system we needed the wms system everything yeah so I, you know, as a hundred percent business owner, you just like where I'm going. So that's like a lot of learning, but as you know, I, we can talk a little bit later. I wish I, what I did, but it's at that time, I remember I hit on one email is from one of the private equity firm. I didn't even know what the PE means at that time. You know, it's like, what that mean? So, but I Google it and it's, is is a, big PE firm. I said, damn, this is legit. So I said, okay, I have a call. So we had a call on my way home. I remember for 30 minutes call, they got so excited. They said, oh my God, I give them, I don't know. I'm not in the MBA class, but I know my numbers. <laughs> so, so I told them the numbers and they said, oh, that's, we never see that kind of number in this, in your field. It's like, so a week later, I meet their managing partner in New York, and uh, he gave me this valuation all the nine yards. I said, whoa, it's hard <laughs> to refuse. <laughs> it's like, and, but he does. Um, so what I really, not just in valuation, it's like, what is the future going to be? So which means we're going to have the structure, we're going to have the system, we're going to have the process. So that is really intrigued me to explore that. And uh, he said, you need an investment banker because he, he saw me with all this, like, you know, terminology, this, that. So, so he introduced me to a uh, investment banker. I went to him and he got so excited. He said, we got this business sold in three months. So I said, oh no, I'm not, I needed to understand what that means. I needed to know because I still wanted to be part of this journey. I just right. needed somebody help. But right, I, right, right. Exactly. Away. So I interviewed my own, um, you know, private banker. I picked uh, Chuck to be my um, advisor. So he literally holding my hand for a whole year and we meet once a week, just go through this. I think I did my mini MBA private equity education for one year. <laughs> so we, uh, in 2018, I picked one private equity, which I feel is the right partner. I exit partially with them. So I'll, now we have a private equity backed the company and we tripled the business since 2018. It's a, uh, it's even through COVID. I yeah. mean, like, <laughs> well, you know what I love about this, this PE guy, like he knew you needed the help to actually get him to be able to have a deal with you. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's, it's again, though, but you, but you, yeah. you, you had to like go do it and learn and, and, uh, you did it and, and tripling the business is, and, and you scaled it, but you, you, you always seem to no, not be afraid to ask for help. Is that something that's a big thing for you? Yeah, I, I feel like that's kind of like every entrepreneur, we face the, the problem, the loneliness, right? In the first 10 years, I think it's really, I put myself in and just all my head in the business, not on the business. It's just, that's the reason why I burn out. I think the, you know, with the YPO, uh, with, you know, there's a lot of women, um, uh, business entrepreneur group as well. It's like, I really learned, it's not just about networking. It's really about like finding those who can understood our struggles, our passion, our dream. So that is a, so important, make you feel you're not alone. I think alone in this entrepreneurial journey is the worst sit, you know, that's why you feel you burn out. So it's lonely. I, I told it like, well, you're, it's lonely in your head, right? Because yep. you need to be able to bounce ideas off people and get perspective, not listen to them, but completely, right. Yep. You don't have to agree with everyone's perspective, but there's something about venting it out and having a, a trusted team of people that you can speak to. Yeah. So one of the thing I, I learned is like, because when I started the business, I do have a partner and, um, so in two partners when I started and uh, it's like one of the episode I, I always talking to some of my group is is the betrayal of the partnership. I have no idea how many when I started talking to people, there's a so common in the business partnership. So I remember when I um, my partner, um, you know, when I started the business, I knew my limitation. I'm a designer. I want to sell my, you know, the design is my thing. Right. It is, I'm not like very run the business, get the business license, find the locations. This is not my thing. So one of the co-worker I worked with before and offered to say, hey, I knew the customer. I had this business experience before. I can help you to run the business to sell your product. So, but I don't have money. I want to, you know, but I want to have some equity. So I said, okay. You know, I was like, I think that naive at that time is definitely, is good and bad. <laughs> it's a good thing. I said, okay, fine. If he can offer this, I have a partner. He can do something I cannot do. So I gave him 8% of the equity. I gave him the CEO title. And I'm the president. So after a year, he's starting asking for more, for 22%. I said, no, you know, it's not right. If you want at the time, first, we have to agree to sell to you. Then we cannot just give you for free. So it's really is like that tension going on. And one day he went to my office, sitting in front of me, starting pulling out a termination letter said I was fired. So it's like literally then like I said, are you joking? You know, it's <laughs> like literally it's like a movie. I said, oh, is this not April Fool, right? It's like then he called the police and the two police come in. He told them I was, you know, did this or that. I should be terminated right now. I needed to be removed from my own company at that time. I don't, the only document I have is operating agreement. I have nothing. He helped me set the company. So later I learned is literally he set me up from the beginning. It's like he own, you know, I didn't do the background check. The number one, if you want a business partner, make sure you cross check background check, make sure they are legit. So it's like, so he own, his, he owned over a million dollars to two banks. So he was desperate at that time. So it's like literally the two police came in, said, ma'am, you need a higher attorney. So it's, I went through 
three months legal battle to get my own company back. Was this prior to the private equity? Yeah, that's well, in the 2009, later wow. on, beginning of the company. is. You know, that's one of the things, John, we're talking about is like you learn. I think actually at that time, seems is the darkest time in my business experience. Literally, you know, you've been, I've been kicked out of my own company and is like removed by a police, two police person <laughs> and I say, okay, you need to leave. It's it's, I was like, you know, my... But what did you learn? I mean, did you... Because you have to ask for help. Like, what I like about your attitude is you want you want to be the best at what you're doing and you want to surround yourself with people that actually can add value it's to like, you. But you probably, what, you just maybe went a little too far or like, what's the lesson know, from that? Is the lesson from them, if I was in the private, is in the WPO, I would know right away. I can call my peers, say, they would tell me, how to do what to do as I Got time, it. And, you know, I have nothing. I know nothing. And I was threatened by my partner because I was an immigrant. She said, you know, you're going to be deported. You're going to be go back to, you know, oh the country God. with a baby. So it's a, it's a fear. It's literally is a threatening. It's like, that's the worst time ever i like i never had it i just couldn't use my wildest imagination i could be treated wow what you got what you got through it and you learned what you needed and you you i think that's the biggest lesson what i learned is like i thank him every day if without that i think i learned it you know how to be tough how to go through it how to you know that's really fueled me i'm gonna make this work so when I got through three months after I get this company back, that's my goal. I'm going to make this company work in my way. And it's, it's, it's very, it's, you know, I, I feel it's really made me tougher as a business person. And, uh, you know, today when I go through the challenges, I say, oh, that's a piece of cake in comparison with that. <laughs> How good is it though that, and I, you know, it's never good, uh, doesn't feel good going through it, but I think almost everything that I had to go through that was the worst thing I could ever feel. Yeah. Wished it never happened. And sometimes you still wish it never happened, but it always was like, wow, that really helped me. It's crazy, but I think we grow through these, like these challenges in a way, unless you go through one. And it always needs time, right? And then yeah. you look back, you're like, thank God. Exactly. Right. right? It's it's yeah. it's unbelievable. Well, listen, I, I mean I could be I could go on and, and talk to you for another three hours. Uh Joe Rogan would, but we're this is not the Joe Rogan podcast. <laughs> he has much more time. Uh and he has a great podcast. But at the end of the day, I want to thank you for uh coming on. This is one of the most inspiring stories I've heard. Uh, you really uh, are unbelievable. I mean, the the amount of your mind, the, the way your mind just like will allow yourself to try is just incredible. So thank you so much for being on, on the podcast. Thank you, John. It's great talking to you. Hi, John Schultz here. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode. Would really appreciate it if you would like, comment, subscribe, and share with your friends. Looking forward to being with you soon.